All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the NNLM Virtual Symposium on Health Misinformation. My name is Erica Lake, and I'm the Medical and Academic Library Outreach Coordinator for Region 6 of the Network of the National Library of Medicine, and I'll be your host for this session. Got just a few uh, technical items to cover before we get started. All attendees have been muted, but we do welcome your comments in the chat at any time. Please be sure to select everyone from the drop down menu when posting your comments to ensure attendees, hosts, and panelists can all see them. If you have questions specifically for our speakers, please use the Q&A function to ensure that they don't get lost in the chat. We'll queue them up as they come in and save them for our speakers to address at the end of their presentation. We have live closed captioner for this event, and you can access the closed captions by clicking on the icon with the three dots and then selecting closed caption. And if you'd like to share on social media, we encourage you to use the hashtag for this event, Health Misinfo NNLM. All right, before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to share just a few words about who we are. NLM, the National Library of Medicine, is one of the 27 institutes and offices of the National Institutes of Health. It's the world's largest biomedical library and produces online resources like PubMed and Medline Plus. NNLM, the network of the National Library of Medicine, is an outreach program of NLM, working to ensure health professionals and the public have equal access to health information. And NLM is made up of seven regional medical libraries, three national offices, and four national centers, all providing training, funding, and engagement opportunities to over 9,000 NNLM member organizations. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our three speakers that we have for this session, how health professionals can leverage social media to combat health misinformation. Dr. Shikka Jain is a hematology and oncology physician and an associate professor of medicine at the University of Illinois in Chicago, as well as the director of communication strategies in medicine and the associate director of oncology communications and digital innovation for the University of Illinois Cancer Center. Lisa Mordell is a second year medical student at Loyola University Chicago Strick School of Medicine. And Dr. Eve Bloomgarden is an endocrinologist at North Shore University Health Systems and is the director of thyroid and the director of endocrine innovation and education for the division of endocrinology. All right, with that, I'm going to hand things over to our speakers now. Thank you, Erica, for that lovely introduction. As Lisa is getting our slides up, I just want to thank everyone for joining us today. We have a lot to cover, so we're going to go through quickly. Um, to start, we're going to have Lisa start off with um, a little bit of uh, a background on, oh, Lisa, you doing okay there? There we go. <laughs> Some technical difficulties to start off this afternoon. So our objectives today, we're going to start off with a little bit of background. Lisa is going to share the creation of our organization impact that was really uh, created at the beginning of the pandemic. The organization was focused on creating and amplifying public health messaging during the ongoing pandemic. Then we'll shift to discuss a little bit about the lessons we learned as an organization, a uh, grassroots kind of organization that became um, very well known nationally very quickly during the pandemic. And we'll present some ideas that can help you to showcase how health professionals can become trusted messengers, as well as highlight why it's so important that health professionals are engaged in this uh, fight against misinformation. And then we'll close out with Dr. Bloomgarden discussing a model for how others can utilize the, the model that we've created and the recipe we've created to engage communities and combat health misinformation within your own organizations and institutions. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Lisa to start, kick us off. Thanks, Shika. So in 2021, the Surgeon General declared misinformation as a public health crisis and called on health professionals and healthcare organizations to proactively engage with patients and the public on health misinformation, as well as to use technology and media with platforms to share accurate health information. However, many healthcare professionals are not accurately trained in the nuances of fighting misinformation or the technology platforms to address medical misinformation. Additionally, there are a lot of risks that medical professionals who engage in advocacy around medical misinformation on social media face. So for example, this is a study from our co-founders, Dr. Vinny Arora and Dr. Shika Jane, on harassment on physicians who participate in advocacy on social media. Ironically, it was actually done before the pandemic, but was published after the pandemic. 
but they found that one in four physicians report being attacked on social media and one of six female physicians report being sexually harassed on social media. So the most common reason for cyberbullying uh, they found was advocacy. And number one within that category was advocating for vaccines specifically. So with this issue, it's pretty difficult to, it can be very difficult to encourage healthcare professionals to advocate when they may not feel safe. Uh, not only we have identified that, but other organizations have as well, such as this is our shot, who's actually one of our partners. Um, they've identified the need to address the issues of harassment online. And part of the reason we've created the impact strategy and done the things that we've done in the way that we've done is because of this. So medical misinformation, specifically vaccine hesitancy, is not a new idea. On the left here, we have a cartoon from the 1800s titled, Better Not Vaccinate Than Vaccinate with Impure Virus of Cowpox. And on the right is an 1802 cartoon entitled, The Cowpox, or The Wonderful Effects of the New Inoculation. And it depicts a very startled crowd uh, with like receiving vaccines and almost morphing into cows. So it's pretty obvious that uh, although we vaccine hesitancy has been a really constant thing recently, it's not new and it's been around for a while. Additionally, the idea of misinformation in healthcare is also not new. This is a paper also from Dr. Aurora, also accepted before the pandemic, <laughs> ironically, uh, and it addresses the misinformation and how, it can, how misinformation can affect the clinician-patient uh, relationship. Uh, in here, we can outline a couple of key types of misinformation. One of them is pseudoscience, which is misinformation due to unscientific claims. Um, another is junk science, which is claims based on fraudulent or disproven data. So fear of vaccines causing autism is an example. Outdated science is due to the incremental nature of science. Information is now outdated or has been revised. So a great example of that is the whole uh, masking controversy that happened at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, inappropriately applied science is misinformation due to clinical, clinical heterogeneity that renders science not relevant to a clinical context. And finally, conflicting interpretations, which is misinformation due to con conflicts in two or more established guidelines. So an example of that may be the U.S. having different guidelines than U.K. during the pandemic. So misinformation is not new, but it is getting worse, and healthcare professionals have a really important role to play here. So it's, I think it's really important to first consider some basics. So why and how did misinformation spread so fast during the pandemic? And a key concept is the, the idea of intent. So misinformation is information that is misleading, inaccurate, or untrue based on currently available evidence, and the decision to specifically share this information may not be done with malicious intent. Whereas disinformation is a category of misinformation that is deliberately created and shared with the intent to deceive, typically for some kind of personal, financial, or political gain. The purpose of disseminating this information is to achieve some secondary gain that often doesn't benefit a target audience. So it can be very common for disinformation to be established by someone and then it to be even further shared as misinformation not without, without malicious intent. And then if you enter social media into the picture, uh, it makes things even a little bit worse. So this is an example of the disinformation dozen and they're just a small group of 12 anti-vaxxers who were responsible for almost two thirds of all anti-vaccine content socially on, so, on social media platforms. So just shows how, how quickly it can spread. So then an infodemic, a term for SHU during the SARS outbreak and was reintroduced in February of 2020 by the WHO is when too much information, including false or misleading information in digital and physical environments is during a disease outbreak. So it causes confusion and risk-taking behaviors that can harm health. It also leads to mistrust in health authorities and undermines public health response. With growing digitization and expansion of social media and internet use, information can sp spread more rapidly and this can help to fill more quickly fill information voids, but can also apply to harmful messages. Um, misinformation spread is often due to being so quickly due to a kind of a concept of the law of rumor from Alport and Postman. So rumors arise when there's ambiguity, am, ambu, uh, ambiguity of the information at hand, as well as the importance of the information to an individual. So when both are very high, they kind of multiply together and it makes a rumor have greater strength. Additionally, social network uh, and factors in. So if a group is highly connected and misinformation can spread quicker. So then when the pandemic hit, if we replace the idea of a connected social network of people with social media, we can see why the rise in misinformation during COVID-19 was so intense. During COVID, the world turned, into, so, turned to social media for information, but unfortunately, social media algorithms and platforms drive content more so based off engagement in an algorithm rather than something being true. Therefore, people, uh, purveyors of disinformation, such as the disinformation dozen uh, mentioned before, 
are able to exploit social media and spread their agenda even further. However, these purveyors are not the only one that have access to social media. We as healthcare professionals also do, and we have an audience. Um, healthcare professionals are seen as trusted messengers. So this is a, a graph from a 2020 Gallup poll showing that healthcare professionals rate highly in Americans' assessment of honesty and ethics. And it's also really important to kind of highlight that nurses have ranked first in Americans' assessment of honesty and ethics for the past 19 years specifically. Therefore, maybe we can turn this, so what we can do is turn the problem of health misinformation online and the fact that healthcare uh, professionals are uniquely positioned uh, to combat the evolved silent, science, uh, science and make it into a solution that we did with impact. So I'm going to start here and talk a little bit about impact. Impact was created at the beginning of the pandemic, and um, we took a very measured approach. Many of us had been doing work in misinformation for years. As an oncologist, I can tell you misinformation is my day to day. And so um, many of us realized at the beginning of the pandemic that there was a real need for trusted messengers. And so you can see this, um, the screenshot uh, of all of us uh, never seeing each other in person for the beginning of the pandemic. It actually took about I think almost a year and a half for many of us to even meet in person for the first time. Next slide, please. So let's talk about what IMPACT was. IMPACT was founded by five physician moms and one physician dad from different academic institutions across the city of Chicago. We all had a social media presence at the beginning of the pandemic, although um, they were all cross buried platforms, but the predominant platform we used was Twitter. And what we realized was that using our combined expertise, we were able to not only expand our reach and amplify each other, but we were also able to expand our organization into multiple other areas. So uh, at the beginning, we were six physicians. Now we consist of nurses, communication experts, pharmacists, people who are experts in epidemiology, health equity. Um, and we also incorporated in some phenomenal student volunteers and student admins. Lisa has been with us since basically the beginning and is a huge reason why Impact what became as successful as it was. We really tapped into our own personal expertise, but then also looked at where the gaps were. What were the things that we really needed to, we needed to fill? And we partnered with those types of individuals across the state of Illinois and eventually across the country. Next slide. So what does IMPACT do? Our goal when we started off the organization was to strategically amplify healthcare worker voices, initially to guide local policymakers and the public during the pandemic. We were utilizing both social and traditional media for maximal effect, which we'll talk a little bit more about when we talk about our formula and our recipe. And we crowdsourced to identify gaps or find volunteers. So crowdsourcing was really a, a powerful form of communication at the beginning of the pandemic. If you remember, we were getting mixed messages from around the world as to how to best uh, quarantine, how to isolate, how to whether masks worked, how to protect ourselves. And so we actually were very fortunate. And one of our founders, Dr. Laura Zimmerman, um, actually runs a Physician Mommy Chicago Facebook group. So we use that group very often for crowdsourcing to see where gaps were um, within the state of Illinois. Um, and then we also partnered with all of these other organizations, such as the Illinois State Medical Society, the University Blood Initiative, um, a new organization that started at the same time as us, Get Me PPE Chicago, that was started by medical students and was identifying areas across the state that didn't have uh, PPE, so nursing homes and high-risk areas. All of these different partnerships, we really work towards amplifying all of their um, all of their initiatives, and they amplified our initiatives. And that I think is the secret sauce for what we were able to do. We partnered with organizations that really needed our help, and we were able to um, uh, amplify them and also amplify our own work at the same time. Um, we were also able to uh, create, as I said, a recipe for kind of crafting and disseminating our message. And the most important thing that we did was we would take on a specific issue and we would repurpose and repackage the information to utilize a kind of cascade effect. Um, one great example of that would be when, for example, Get Me PPE identified nursing homes as a very vulnerable area and an area that needed PPE. We went to our Facebook group and we posted um, for people to donate PPE there. We would um, ask people if they were seeing other areas that were in need, and then we will funnel all of that information to the Get Me PPE Chicago group. And um, basically through crowdsourcing, we were able to get hundreds of thousands of uh 
gowns and masks and hand sanitizer and other resources across the state and eventually across the Midwest. Next slide, please. So tackling misinformation, this is one of the biggest things that we do is impact, and I'm really proud of the work we've been able to do. We use innovative ways to tackle misinformation, and I think the most important thing that we realized early on is we need to really reach people where they are. So people get information in different ways. Some people get information from newspapers. Some people get information from the TV. Some people get information online. We partnered with Bump Club, um, which is a national organization, to talk to mothers. Um, and these are uh, community members across the, the the world, really, who access the Facebook Lives that we did with that organization. Um, again, targeting specific topics based on what was the most needed aspect of the day. Let's talk a little bit about our infographic series. So we've created over 80 infographics since we launched, and we took a format that was adapted from climate scientists in their debunking handbook in 2020. These uh, infographics that we utilized really had thousands to hundreds of thousands of shares, impressions, engagements. We were even, even able to print out some of these infographics and create handbooks that were available at live events, and they were also distributed in doctor's offices across the state. Um, the infographics that we created were utilized by both the Society of Hospital Medicine and Chicago Public Libraries. And we've been able to see our infographics disseminated on TV news, in newspapers, and most recently in a book chapter where we um, outlined our recipe for success in combating misinformation. Um, we published uh, academic papers as well on the topic, as you can see here, a coordinated strategy to develop and distribute infographics addressing vaccine hesitancy and misinformation. And um, interestingly enough, as it is in this day and age, many of our infographics were picked up by popular news. As you can see here on the right side, Nicki Minaj had actually been talking about COVID-19 vaccine claims and Dr. Aurora was uh, was mentioned. And so she was able to use our infographic to uh, live action debunk misinformation um, in conversations that were happening around this article. Next slide, please. So I think it's really important that we emphasize the fact that advocacy efforts are not just going to the Hill and lobbying and doing your what's traditionally seen as advocacy. We as an organization use really um, unique and innovative ways to incorporate advocacy into our misinformation campaigns. Um, we did deliver over 13 policy level letters focused on different topics. So everything from a shelter in place order to healthcare worker, personal protective equipment, universal masking, vaccination. Um, and these petitions and letters that we sent to our local government leaders garnered thousands of signatures from healthcare workers. Again, we utilize social media to um, to really garner support for these types of initiatives. We would go to our Facebook groups, both with the Physician Mommy Chicago group, as well as our partners such as Vaccine Hunters and other Facebook groups, and ask what are the needs, what is the concern, what are you seeing right now? We would draft a letter accordingly to where the gaps needed to be filled, and then we would post the letter asking people for signatures before we sent it to our local leaders. And we were able to see real-time impact of our advocacy efforts from the traditional sense of um, an advocacy letter would be sent, and we would see at a press conference um, discussion of the letter, how many people signed, and what steps were going to be taken in order to address our concerns. You can see in the picture in the top right, Dr. Ali Khan, another one of our founders, um, speaking at one of the City of Chicago press conferences. We published over 50 op-eds on COVID-19 in high-impact news outlets and contributed to over 200 local and national news features. This gets back to reaching people where they are. Again, advocacy efforts are really important, but you need to be really strategic in how you're engaging in this advocacy. One of the things that we learned early on with Impact is we needed to figure out what exactly we were trying to accomplish and then figure out the best avenue for that. Would it make sense to send a letter to the governor or would it make sense to put out a petition? Would it make sense to go on the local news and talk about an issue to get to the community? Or would it make sense to write an op-ed or a letter to the editor in the Chicago Tribune? So really thinking strategically about what your goal is, what outcome you want to achieve, and then what tools you can utilize um, in order to uh, have the biggest impact of your advocacy efforts. Uh, next slide, please. So we created an advocacy toolkit that helps to address how to ad attack uh, and address misinformation um, on our website, which you can access on impact uh, on our impact for HC website. Um, and this toolkit has been utilized by other organizations across the nation at this point. So um, happy for you to check it out and utilize it for your own organization. Next slide, please. 
So again, this goes back to what I was saying uh, a few slides ago, how important it is to select an advocacy tool. And I want to emphasize here that, again, advocacy tools are not just what you traditionally think of advocacy. It does not mean you have to write a letter to, um, to your governor or a statement. It doesn't mean that you have to lobby um, at the Capitol. There's a lot of different ways to combat misinformation and advocate for uh, evidence-based messaging and advocate for evidence-based uh, initiatives. So different formats that we found worked really well were letters to the governor, op-eds, the infographics I mentioned, petitions, blog posts, Facebook live chat. So utilizing social media to really emphasize our uh, topics and our um, and our messaging, I think, was really important. And again, we used kind of a, uh, a cascade effect, which I will talk about in one of the upcoming slides. Next slide, please. So this is some examples of some of our infographics that we've created. We're really proud of these. And I have to say, these were actually championed by our students. So our student interns are the ones who really created the infographics with the guidance of, um, of the leadership with an impact. And I want to emphasize one thing here that I think is incredibly important. We learned a lot from our students throughout this time because our students have a finger on the pulse of how to reach the younger generation, which I've recently been told I'm no longer a part of the younger generation. So learning from our students was really, really helpful because the students were not only able to tell us how to reach their generation, but also how to reach their communities, how to reach colleges, how to reach um, people who may be able to get the messaging out to different communities that we might not have access to. Our infographics are very simple to read. As you can see, they don't have a lot of verbiage on them. We make sure that the, um, the uh, health literacy is taken into account. And depending on what the topic is and who we're trying to target, um, we want to make sure that it's easy to read, easy to understand, and easy to distribute as well. Um, some of our highest uh, impact infographics early on had, as I said, hundreds of thousands of impressions, and we would share them across multiple social media platforms like Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Next slide, please. One of our most uh, well-received and effective and impactful uh, infographic series was our myth debunking series. So we would create a series based on whatever crowdsourced off social media myths we were seeing, whether it was what we were seeing ourselves or what our colleagues were seeing or what community members were seeing. Um, I think that one of the things that were really was really powerful for this particular series was we not only went to healthcare professionals, we also went to the community. So we went to, for example, the Vaccine Hunter um, Facebook group and would ask, what are you seeing as concerns? What misinformation are you seeing? And then we would address our infographics accordingly. Anytime you're trying to debunk information online, it's incredibly important that you start with the fact. Um, it's been proven time and time again, and it's been studied that if you start off with the with the misinformation or with the myth, it's more likely that people will remember that information. So I think it's really important to remember, start with the fact, state the truth first, then you can explain the myth and why um, and point to that as as a myth and misinformation. And then you can focus on describing and explaining why the misinformation is false. So it's kind of sandwiching the lie between two truths. Um, and this was one that we did at the beginning talking about infertility and vaccines. And uh, I saw a question pop up, what type of uh, uh, programming did we use? We predominantly use uh, Canva. Um, we did use Vengage as well, but we found that Canva is really easy to utilize in creating these types of uh, infographics. Next slide, please. So, the amazing thing about our efforts throughout the pandemic is we were able to see how our social media and um, traditional media advocacy efforts were actually able to lead to real world impact. So we created when when the vaccines first came out, we created a vaccine clearinghouse. The first thing we realized was uh, healthcare workers who are not associated with large academic institutions were having trouble getting the vaccine. So initially, our vaccine clearinghouse was dedicated to those uh, healthcare workers who um, who were not able to get vaccinated, and we were able to get thousands of healthcare workers vaccinated by providing resources and partnering with Oak Street Health um, here in Illinois, who basically were able to get thousands of people vaccinated who learn from our vaccine clearinghouse from social media where they could go to get vaccines. When vaccines became available to um, to people who are not in healthcare, we updated our uh, vaccine clearinghouse almost hourly, sometimes even by the minute, with tips and tricks as to where you could get a vaccine, how you could register, when new vaccine appointments were going to be dropping. 
one of the biggest things we saw in Illinois and across the country was disparities in vaccine distribution because a lot of people can't take off time during the day to go get a vaccine. Um, the most uh, vulnerable communities may not have access to Wi-Fi or internet or broadband. So we were able to not only create this online social media effort um, and create a vaccine clearinghouse that was updated regularly, we also were able to print out our infographic um, and have it distributed in some of the more higher risk areas. So um, people in their churches or going to their local physician who may not know how to get a vaccine were able to access that information through our, um, through our flyers and our infographics, as well as our vaccine clearinghouse house. And again, we partnered with uh, Facebook groups such as Chicago Vaccine Hunters and put that information in those groups. And they were able to provide us information. So they would be posting in the group, just so you know, Walgreens is opening up a slot at noon today. Um, and we were able to put that into, into our vaccine clearing house, which was able to get thousands of people vaccinated. So we saw a real, real world effect. Next slide. And as you can see here, through the Vaccine Clearinghouse, we were actually able to organize numerous vaccine events. Um, two uh, really important people in this slide, Dr. Hala Akbarnia um, in the yellow and Dr. Eve Bloomgarden. Uh, Dr. Hala Akbarnia is also on the far right, uh, wearing that green shirt, doing the thumbs up. She single-handedly, I would say, probably coordinated over um, 700 or over 1,000 um, volunteers and registered thousands of people to get vaccines and created vaccine events. And again, this is all utilizing our online social media presence and garnering uh, garnering uh, information, finding out where the holes were, where the vaccine events were needed, setting up those vaccine events, and then disseminating the information on social media and traditional media. And then at the events themselves, those infographics that we created for online, we actually also printed them out and had them available to address uh, misinformation and questions that people had at these vaccine events. We also had our infographics translated into Spanish as well, which I think was really important, making sure that our information was accessible. Um, and we had partnered with food depositories, food banks, with churches, and were able to get a lot of people in those really vulnerable areas vaccinated utilizing our social media campaigns, which was really, it was really great to see our advocacy efforts and our misinformation efforts uh, translate into real world, world impacts. And um, many people who volunteered at these vaccine events actually had people come up to them and tell us that they had seen our misinformation um, infographics online, they were hesitant about getting the vaccine, and they changed their mind when they um, visited some of our information. So really uh, an amazing thing to see our impact in real real time. Next slide, please. So let's uh, talk about the recipe. The recipe for success that we discovered. There are two really big components. One is repurposing any content that's created. And two is disseminating and amplifying via, so via social media, not only our own efforts, but our partners' efforts. So let's first talk a little bit about repurposing content. So the best way I can describe this is we would take whatever the most important topic at the time was. So for example, masking. If masking was the biggest issue, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, we would start off with, all right, let's create infographics related to masking, whether it was misinformation on masking, um, whether it was just understanding why masks work. Uh, we created some amazing infographics on staying six feet apart, not under. We then would utilize that same infographic and the data from that and the information from that. And we actually would create a blog post. And so that blog post would go into more details specifically related to the infographic. And then we would create a Facebook Live so or a, a YouTube video. So if people get their information through videos, we would have that available to them through videos. Some innovative things we did when we created Six Feet Apart, Not Under, we actually created a song. And so that song we put on YouTube and we actually got the song picked up by our local news media. So the next thing you would do is we would say, okay, who, who are we missing? We went on Facebook Bump Club Lives and the same exact topic that we were using for our infographics, for our blog posts, for our impactful chat, we would now take it to the moms. So Bump Club and Beyond did a great deal of work with us addressing misinformation using their, um, their Facebook Live chats. 
then we would pitch it to the local news media. So our infographics and our op-eds were featured in local news media. And then we would write an op-ed. So again, it's taking the exact same information and putting it out there in as many possible ways as possible, because you don't know if people get their information from the TV news, from the newspaper, from YouTube, from social media. So we tried to be very consistent in our messaging and target as many different avenues as we could. So that's repurposing the content. Then the biggest part I think that made us the most successful was our partners. So our partners would share with us things that they were working on and we would share with them things that we were working on. And then we would amplify the work they were doing and we would amplify the work we were doing. And again, we tried to keep it again in the same kind of repurposing the same type of content. So it would be one week we'd be focusing on one topic. Another week we may need to focus on vaccine hesitancy. But we really look to see in the news media and through our crowdsourcing, through social media, where were the gaps and what needed to be focused on in the moment. And next slide, please. So again, the biggest takeaway from this is you need to figure out how to repurpose your content and then amplify. The thing that I think we did a lot at the beginning of the pandemic was very reactionary because information was being poured at us and thrown at us so fast that we had to be very reactionary. We had to do all of these things kind of in, in, um, in a very fast way. We had a rapid response team. Now we've got the benefit of having a little bit more time and a lot of the public health crises are ongoing or have been going on for years. And so we can also incorporate in things like academic publications, presentations, um, and, and get this information out again in multiple different ways. So repurposing the content I think is very important, getting that information to multiple different um, areas. When we talk about amplifying our partners, when we, we did that through social media by not only posting on our social media accounts, asking team members to share it on their own accounts, quote tweeting and tagging others, using the hashtags that we knew had the highest reach. We created some of our own hashtags, like six feet apart, not under, that ended up uh, having a very large reach because we created a song that went along with it. Um, tagging partners and um, organizations and other relevant organizations that are really going to be in, uh, engaged in what you're working on. Um, liking and replying to all positive comments. I recommend um, maybe commenting once or twice on uh, negative comments or trolls just to put the information out there. But we really worked on not engaging with the trolls because engaging with the trolls, as you all know, can be very exhausting and can uh, can also lead to uh, negative interactions. So what I suggest to people is if somebody says something negative on one of your tweets or one of your posts, I usually thank them for responding. I will give them some factual evidence-based information um, in, in response and usually put in an article in there. And I'm not doing that to really change the mind of the person who's attacking us. I'm really using it as a way to, um, to bring other people to understand um, that our information is based on science and evidence. Um, so it's really about those people who sit on the fence who might read the, the troll comment and wonder if they're actually presenting accurate information. So um, that's one way to engage and to amplify as well. And then bumping posts of, of team members. So especially on Facebook, um, if you're in a Facebook group, putting bump actually increases the algorithmic um, availability of these types of posts. So um, that's really how we repurpose the content and amplified other people's work. And then um, Dr. Bloomgarden is going to talk in a little bit about um, how we amplify each other's work as well with our Twitter amplifiers. Uh, next slide. So with that, I'm going to hand the microphone over to Dr. Bloomgarden to take us home. All right. It is um, it is so lovely to be here. And also, um, I, it is amazing to hear all of the things that we did. And, you know, after blocking out the last few years for various reasons, it's it's cool to, mem to remember them. Um, and my children still sing our Six Feet Apart and Under song. Uh, they loved that song. Um, okay. So we did all this work and we're going to kind of talk about how we divide up the the history the present and the future of impact um but you know we spent the last 12 months or so publishing the message um in um within the healthcare space or within the science um communication space i i might sing it for you maybe we'll find the link for you um and um the uh we, we've also been able to um move into new um new spaces that naturally flow based on the formula that we um that we came up with and that we're going to address and this is just kind of an overview of various things that we were able to do through the healthcare um uh, world using podcasts at uh, op-eds in the Washington Post the New England Journal articles as well as the double AMC um next slide please 
And um, a key component of the success of, of this work was something that we did in the background of social media. So we really relied heavily on what we call the amplifier, which is the a group text thread with, that is embedded in t- into Twitter. And we had an impact amplifier there um, that uh, I would say at, at the peak was maybe 50 people. Um, and it really uh, was a way for us to rapidly communicate in real time in order to have a coordinated response reaction and to um, do a pulse check or a temperature check of what we're thinking about something if we hear something. And also we had uh, we had accumulated various experts um, that were involved on the back facing side of impact, um, but uh, um, who, who we needed to um, recruit and to, to weigh in on various different things that arose during the pandemic and have arisen, um, you know, as we move out of out of the um, COVID world. And um, it was really a, an experience for us to have this access and this constant conversation um, because it allowed for us to respond in real time on social media and off social media, and it kept our message really consistent. And so here's um, our JMIR article on the use of Twitter amplifiers by medical professionals to combat misinformation during the COVID-19 pandemic. I would say this in and of itself was one of our most critical communication strategies. Um, And next slide, please. And here we actually... um, decided to pivot back to academia and um, our healthcare space to publish our what we call our formula. And this is um, at the very beginning of the pandemic, I would say March 13th, 2020, when we were all kind of panicking online and we didn't know each other well yet. Um, we, um, we, we started really trying to figure out what do we do? How do we communicate the science that's coming in from Europe, that's coming in from China, that we're, that we're hearing in our medical circles? How do we pivot and discuss with our communities and have the biggest impact. And so instead of taking a national approach, um, you know, and trying to get federal um, policy changes, uh, we thought our biggest impact would be if we if we stayed local. And so what we really did was a um, a place based approach to making an impact using a virtual or social media predominant strategy during a time of lockdown. And so um, we um, describe how we did this and how we had we were so effective by working within our own networks and using our own political clout and connections, as well as connections made during that time of crisis in order to really um, keep our, the Illinois Chicagoland area um, safe and uh, knowledgeable and on the um, on the evidence-based side of, um, of science information that was coming out to the best that we could. Um, next slide, please. And a key to all of this is we're educating the next generation. And I feel so old when I say that sentence, but it's true. Um, we um, wrote an article um, for the New England Journal of Medicine on um, on train on what was needed in order to us for us to be able to respond to the Surgeon General's call for healthcare workers to engage in combating misinformation and countering misinformation. Um, and so we. We have been doing that, but what we really pointed out, and I think we were one of the first ones to do so, was that we don't have any training in this as, and it's not part of medical education. And so we needed to incorporate that. Um, We also were unsupported in terms of the vitriol that was coming our way and comes, you know, we we see every day on, in social media in particular, but also that was in real, in real time and in person. And so we needed support for those people who were being attacked or doxxed or um, slandered, you know, online. Um, And then we really needed some sort of organized way to fight disinformation at its source. So kind of this three tiered call um, from from us to the healthcare space saying, this is what's needed for us to be able to answer the Surgeon General's call and really stay engaged in this space. Next slide, please. So then in 2020, you know, if we're gonna name years by a word or so, 2020 for us was a year of action. It was a bit frenetic. Um, we just kind of were whack a mole you know, what was coming out, what we're hearing, where it was very, very go, go, go. So we gathered a lot of data. We did a lot of trial and error and testing. We, we had, a lot of communication with people who had expertise within um, the spaces of science communication and epidemiology and infectious disease and made sure that we were accurate. And we gained a lot of real world critical experience. 2021 to 2022, which we'll call like the world's longest year, um, we learned a lot and we really were able to hone in our reputation as a credible source of information and as a connector in the SciComm space. And um, that was evidenced by uh, invitations for national and international talks. I think we, we were gave us a talk here um, in 2021. So in that year of credible um, information and other, um, you know, uh, both local, regionally, and also um, 
uh, across the country. Um, now in 2023 and beyond, we're sharing our experience with others. We've published our stories. We've created toolkits that we're resharing and making sure are up to date. We have um, kind of perfected or uh, at least perfected the way that we present our impact model and we have our websites and um, our publications available to share. And so at this point, I could say we we know how to use our formula for success um, to amplify voices and address misinformation. And we are excited that you will join us. So tag us when you're doing the same. Let me tell you a little bit about where we've gone since. So next slide, please. So it turns out that um, physicians are really at the center of multiple overlapping, intersecting um, public health emergencies and things that I would say have really come to the forefront over the last year or so, um, but had, had been on our minds and we've all been active in this space already. So um, firearm injuries, we're gonna come back to this, but one of the things that um, has been the most tragic is is the number of uh, of injuries and, and deaths and uh, damage done by gun violence. And so um, we have a lot of, effort in that space right now. Countering misinformation and rebuilding trust as it continues to erode within the healthcare community as healthcare, um, the system is, you know, a little bit broken right now. <laughs> it's an understatement. It's broken and we are burnt out. And there's a lot that we are trying to do to maintain and to rebuild and to regain trust um, in vaccines, not COVID vaccines per se, but all vaccines in gender equity and reproductive health care and gender affirming care. Um, we have the policy side of things with telemedicine and prior authorizations. Um, and again, the struggle of workforce shortage, burnout, and the list The list is endless. Um, but luckily, our formula works for many of these things. Next slide. So what we've done in the gun violence space, this is, I'm going to give credit to um, our, um, I don't know, our, our impact, uh, I think she's chief of community outreach, but really she's our superstar, Dr. Hala Afarnia, who um, is someone who was very, very active already in the gun violence prevention space. And she is an ER doctor, but she has really taken the lead as the impact uh, gun violence um, liaison, you know, prevention liaison as someone with uh, personal and um, professional expertise in this area. The reason why we're so invested in this space is Every day, 321 people are shot in the United States. So that includes 111 people who are killed, 210 who are survived their gunshot injuries, 95 who are intentionally shot by someone else, 42 who are murdered, 65 from gun suicide, and the list goes on and on and on. And we know that firearm injuries are the number one cause of death in children, um, surpassing every other cause as of 2020, and that that is going up. We also um, are, you know, our local community includes uh, Chicago, which has really high um, gun violence violence um, uh, on a daily basis and um, in Highland Park Hospital, which is around the corner from us um, right here. And so we had a lot of secondary trauma, a lot of primary trauma. There's just a lot um, happening in this space that we we felt like we really needed to get involved in. So what we do is we um, we participate and partner with other organizations using our formula. Um, you know, we um, have been able to uh, uh, partner to to do virtual discussions to hold um, re to have resources available for the community and to, we have a constantly updated um, resource page here um, that is um, uh, that is uh, available to all. Next slide, please. Okay, and I'm going to just be really fast here. This is just another an emphasis here. Dr. Akbarnia speaking out um, about uh, gun violence prevention. Next slide. Um, we've also um, made statements um, on uh, the uh, overturning of Roe versus Wade. And this is our letter to Governor Pritzker about um, uh, urging uh, safe harbor protections for patients and for abortion providers after uh, June 2022, um, uh, so that we knew people were coming into Illinois um, on both sides of the equation and um, needed to be able to protect people coming across our borders. Next slide. And this is just a, a talk that I had given to OBGYN um, in order that that really reemphasized what's going on in Illinois right now. Uh, the Illinois Illinois here is in blue. You can see that we are really smack dab in the center of things, and so um, we were able to get uh, some word out using our pre-established networks and to make sure that we could support our healthcare worker colleagues as well. Next slide. So I'm going to be really really fast here. This is just a um, us more evidence of us sharing beyond the pandemic um, and sharing um, our impact knowledge. Next slide. Um, we've been able to um, use our infographic talents in order to uh, just raise awareness about healthcare issues to support um, various uh, enterprises and um, to get involved in other infectious disease um, topics du jour. Next slide. Like monkeypox, next slide. 
And uh, recently, Dr. Jane um, it was invited to um, be part of this um, committee on how to create a global impact for uh, engaging in trusted scientific information and to counter misinformation. And this is through the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine and Impact. And our impact team, mostly students and our lead, Dr. Tejal Shaw, have been um, working really um, diligently to provide new updated infographics on understanding mis and disinformation and on addressing this call. Next slide. Um, lessons learned, I think we can all we can all say many, 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 um, but physician voices are really trusted, so we need to know how to use them. Social media is a double-edged sword, but it is a tool and it can be very effective um, in crowdsourcing and in disseminating critical information. And um, community partnerships are, are key to success here. Next slide. And um, again, we, we've covered this already. Next slide. So probably one of the coolest things that happened uh, was that we were featured in Time Magazine, along with many of our partner organizations and those nerdy girls at Dear Pandemic, for example. And um, we got to show our parents. So that was really cool. Um, and really what this really highlights is that it was our inner, you know, our, all of our various hats that we wear on a day to day basis overlapping, allowing us to be in the right space at the right time to take on this work. Next slide. So get involved, please tag us on social media, please reach out with questions. We're excited to um, to hear from you. And um, we have a couple of minutes, I think, left for questions. Um, and if we go just to the last slide and then we can come back here. Um, I just wanna show off our team. This is <laughs> this was one of the iterations of our team. It's growing and expanding all the time as people come and go, um, but it's a really, really awesome team. And, um, oh, hi, Amanda. Um, we'll go back, we'll, we'll end on our, uh, social media links page, just so if anybody wants to jot that down. And um, we are open for questions. And I um, I want to emphasize a point that uh, Dr. Bloomgarden made, which is the formula that we utilize throughout the COVID pandemic is what we're utilizing for all of those other topics that she talked about, whether it was gun violence or reproductive uh, health. And so um, the formula works and the formula can be repurposed for really any topic. And I think that's incredibly important for um for anyone who's listening today that we have um we have resources for you if you're interested um so let's go to the q a so the first question um i'm going to uh i'm going to put to dr bloomgarden um unfortunately i have read and seen on social media nurses and other healthcare professionals spreading misinformation around covid and vaccines during the pandemic what was your experience with this and how did you address it in your community so if you can address that we've got about 13 minutes i think for questions so and i think we've got four or five questions in the chat Okay, I can talk very fast. So, um, yes, this is a huge issue. Um, there's a very, very small number of healthcare professionals who have um, done a ton of damage um, in terms of um, lowering uh, trust uh, in, in healthcare and in medicine and science in general. And we have done a variety of things as this situation evolves. So in July of 2021, um, I myself, along with three other um, physicians wrote an op-ed for the Washington Post, um, basically calling out um, this situation and, and calling on the FSMB, who is the Federation of State Medical Boards, to actually follow up with their statement that, that people will be held accountable and to put some um, action into or words into action here. And we um, we've really not seen a ton of activity here. There's a lot of reasons for that, but it is something that we need to continue to push on um, our legal colleagues and our medical boards to demand accountability for people who are intentionally generating and spreading hate for secondary gain. Um, and, um, you know, in California, AB 2098 um, was uh, did pass, which was the holding accountable, um, you know, holding them physicians accountable for the spreading of misinformation. But now, of course, it's it's in a lawsuit um, due to one of the physicians who is benefiting from this. So there's a lot that goes there um, that goes into this. But yes, it's an ongoing evolving situation that we are all too aware of. And we would be more aggressive about it if we weren't also, um, you know, afraid of the backlash, which has unfortunately been happening to many people who are in the spotlight trying to found, uh, counter this. Okay. And I will, I will, great, amazing answer, Dr. Bloomgarden. And I would add that um, the challenge is, and this has been the challenge with misinformation in general, is we talked about the disinformation dozen, that there's a small group of people who are able to amplify um, misinformation very rapidly because of their resources. So with things like our amplifier, we've tried to combat that using similar strategies to what they use. Um, unfortunately, there's always going to be people out there doing this for personal gain. And I think when we get to the point that we have to emphasize the fact that we are doing this in our free time and not for money. We're doing it without any secondary gain. I think that also 
helps to um, improve our standing and the trust that we have. Um, the next question is if there is any collaboration between impact and local public health departments or the state public health department. So I can touch on that briefly. Yes, there absolutely was. We worked with um, the public health department as well as with places like the Illinois State Medical Society, the Chicago Medical Society. We were in communication pretty regularly with them in an unofficial capacity. We would be texting, we would be um, we would be doing uh, a lot of uh, uh, backdoor discussions. Um, we were getting input as to who we needed to contact and when, and we were really um, kind of streamlining the information from the rest of the uh, community to the public health department, um, again, in both unofficial and official capacities. So the official capacities we threw through letters, the unofficial capacities were us having relationships with those individuals. Um, we actually, uh, our Congressman was actually incredibly useful. We would text him um, when there was something happening that we were all panicking about and saying, hey, this is not being addressed. Our hospitals are completely like overwhelmed and it seems like no one knows. So we would text him and say, this is the issue. And he would say, okay, if you can write a letter or do this and get it to my office, then we can take the next step. So we did work very closely with not only the public health offices, um, but also with our local government agencies. Um, and we continue but, to do that in terms of in the gun violence space and the in the uh, reproductive health space as well, using those established channels um, so that we make sure that we have the right um, that, that we're getting having the least amount of effort for the most amount of impact because we all have busy lives as well. And so um, our, our relationships that we've established have really um, continued to pay themselves forward. I really want to address this librarian question because I really like this. Um, I, I'm happy to read the question, but or um, or answer it or I don't know if um, Shika or Lisa was, but the the. Short answer is yes, we love working with before academic you, and medical libraries. Before you answer it, let me yeah. read the question um, so people know what it is. So the question that came in was, um, do you work with any medical academic libraries? If not, I'd highly advocate for it. And this is coming from an individual who's a medical education librarian. So um, uh, Dr. Boomgarden, if you can talk a little bit about how we did partner with librarians and libraries and what exactly we did. Sure. So um, I'm going to give a... a shout out to a talk that's coming up in I think an hour or two um, in this exact auditorium that is um, from uh, uh, Dr. Vinnie Aurora and Sarah Saratelli and, and some of our medical librarians as well at um, University of Chicago. Um, we initially, as part of IMPACT, we partnered with Chicago Public Libraries in order to um, disseminate information and infographics and also to um, have a resource for being the experts on information procurement and um, translation. So yes, we did um, work closely with librarians and also through um, our, our various health institutes, um, we were able to um, not only uh, use them as a resource or use you as a resource, but we have a, a medical education course that we've been teaching at University of Chicago for the last few years that um, multiple sessions of that course are taught by our librarians. So um, absolutely. And I think it's an underutilized uh, partnership that we, um, we, we are excited that we have used, have been able to uh, benefit from. And Josephine, I know you mentioned you might be interested in getting involved. Please feel free to reach out to us. We'd love to work with you if this is a space that you're interested in. Um, as we talked about, initially impact was place-based, but we have partnered with so many organizations around the country and so many individuals across the country that we always love meeting new people who are interested in doing uh, similar work. So if you'd like to reach out to us, please feel free. And then the uh, final question I think is about the platforms, right? So, um, did you find one platform to be better for civilized discourse? I'm going to have Lisa weigh in on this um, if if she's uh, up to it. Um, and then if you could only choose one platform, which one would you choose? I personally feel like Twitter, we were super successful in, in general to like reach more people. But I think in terms of the most impact, it might have been Facebook because we were able to reach a lot of moms, like plug in through um the different groups and things like that and chicago vaccine hunters which is a mommy chicago and like crowdsource a ton of information there i don't know if you guys have a different response if you guys think twitter or facebook but probably one of those two i think if we had to pick one maybe twitter because it had the furthest reach so i would say i agree i think that i'm um obviously with Twitter being under new ownership now, we're not sure what is going to happen and how the engagement is going to be on Twitter in the next uh, in the next iteration of it. But I would say um, it was different platforms for different uh, needs, right? So Facebook, I think the biggest uh, impact we had with Facebook was we were able to crowdsource really well there. We were able to targeted crowdsource as well. So specific locations, specific uh, groups of people like the Physician Mommy Chicago group or the Vaccine Hunter group. So I think we were able to use Facebook for a lot of that. 
The other thing is dissemination of our messaging. I was able to get messaging out to people who have known me for my entire life, but I haven't talked to since I was in high school or middle school. I had preschool teachers emailing me saying they saw the posts that I was putting on Facebook. So I think that uh, you're absolutely right. Facebook was, we were able to reach a very different audience. Twitter, I think was a really huge place for us academically and in the healthcare space. So Twitter was a really great place for us to get information um, and also to engage with other healthcare professionals. Um, it was a great way to disseminate information as well. Um, Twitter, as uh, Dr. Boomgarden just said, Twitter was huge for journalistic collaboration. So um, when we uh, were getting quoted in you know, CNN or in the New York Times, it was because usually a journalist found a tweet of ours on, on Twitter. Um, I was quoted in some random golf journal at one point, which I don't, I haven't golfed since I was 14, but it was pretty cool. And they found a tweet that I had, the Nicki Minaj uh, tweet that um, Dr. Aurora put out that ended up on, um, uh, in, uh, in a, I don't remember what publication, but maybe the Huffington Post or, or something like that. So um, I think it really depends uh, what you're looking for. The other thing that I think is important is videos. So video content, short videos are usually um, the highest engagement across all social media platforms. Um, so that's really important as well. But again, um, brand recognition and using the same content across platforms, like Dr. Bloomgarden just said, that waterfall effect with our recipe worked really, really well. And I think we have time for one more question if anybody else has another question to ask because Dr. Bloomgarden did such a great job of talking so fast. <laughs> I mean, I could do, I could go faster. And if anyone's interested, I did post the link to our YouTube song, Six Feet Apart, Not Under, where you will hear both myself and Dr. Bloomgarden, and I think some of our children singing in- Our uh, children. And the song was written by Dr. Um, Mylan Martinez, who's an amazing musician and amazing physician. As Dr. Well. Bloomgarden, you're being asked, we've got four minutes left. I'm, I'm, you're going to have to sing the song. Okay. Okay. Um, I can't remember. It. No, I can't, I can't. Okay, I'll sing it. Ready? Okay, yeah. I'll sing it with you. It's stay, stay inside. I'll let you do it. On your own side. This song I sung her six feet apart, not under. <laughs> it's been a long time since we've heard it. Well, I don't but... even know what I had for breakfast, but I remember the song from 2020s. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely check out the YouTube link. It's quite an entertaining clip and it's only about a minute and a half. So, and um, the other thing that I think is really cool that we were able to do with all these connections, we were able to um, take pictures of our children uh, getting vaccinated and our kids were so proud to show off their, their little vaccine stickers. My daughter had her picture on the local news showing that she was one of the kids who got vaccinated. So, um, you know, we were able to get our families involved as well, which I think was really important because uh, as we all know, something that we didn't talk about too much on this, but there was a lot of uh, a lot of burnout amongst the healthcare professionals. So we also tried to focus on not just the advocacy efforts and, and all the work, but also trying to make it fun if we could to keep ourselves engaged. Um, we created these amazing vaccine certificates for kids when the vaccine came out for them. And we had people print them out and um, highlighted them on our social media when they had an impact vaccine certificate. So I think that while this work is really important and combating misinformation is an incredibly important thing for us to be doing, and it's super important for us to be focused on, we also were um, really focused on making sure that we tried to keep our heads about us and created this amazing community of uh, other healthcare workers who supported us. And I think that community that we built over the last three years has been really important for our ability to continue doing this work because without it, I think we all would have burned out. I've typed it, an answer to the last and final question, which is how do you fund all of this work? And um, we don't really fund all this work. A lot of, most of this is volunteer. We are um, 501c3 nonprofit organization. If anybody wants to, you know, contribute, um, but um, we, we were able to get a lot of, um, you know, of the tech uh, as part of a nonprofit, you know, as complimentary. And then we have small amounts of funds to pay some administrative assistance um, and, you um, uh, for our summer student interns, for example. Um, but a lot of it is, it remains unfunded. And so it's a labor of love. Um, and um, maybe we'll pivot one day um, to, to change that. But for now, it's just, um, it's just what we do. And we, we did apply for some small grants that we were able to get. So that was very helpful. Um, and I think one thing that I've been able to do with my job is 
uh, I've incorporated it into a part of my my professional development and what I do for my career. So um, I think if this is something that you're interested in doing, uh, if you're in a position to discuss with the higher ups in your institution, whether this can be something that could be a part of your job description, because public health messaging is important for all healthcare workers. That's another possibility to help get this funded. But yeah, we uh, we are um, we are largely volunteer driven. Wonderful. Well, we made it right to time. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it was lovely uh, to engage with all of you and some really phenomenal questions today. So thank you so much for joining us and uh, feel free to reach out to us on social media anytime. Oh, and a big, round of, a big round of applause to all of you. Oh, that was fantastic. I'm so inspired and I really appreciate you sharing your recipe. So we've got our, our two major steps here to follow. Um, Awesome. Um, I just want to quickly say to everybody who's attending that um, we do have continuing education credits available for this session. You'll receive an email after the symposium ends with a questionnaire and instructions on how to claim that. Um, this is available for CHESS and for um, MLA and CPH um, CE. And we've just got about 30 minutes or so to the next session that will begin at 3 p.m. Eastern time. So we'll welcome you back then. Um, and I encourage you to check out NNLM membership if your organization is not already a part of our, our membership. Um, lastly, if you've been enjoying this conversation, we do have an ongoing series of health misinformation webinars that will be happening with additional expert guest speakers. They'll be hour long sessions and they'll be taking place intermittently throughout the rest of the year. And you can check out upcoming sessions on the NNLM training calendar. So thanks to everyone for attending and thank you again to our presenters. Wonderful. Have a good rest of your afternoon.